Music is an enormous social phenomenon, and it comes in as the second most searched for topic on the Google search engine. Music and sound are a type of auditory collage that connect us to the personal memories and the experiences of our lives. When a recipient of a cochlear implant gains the ability to hear, what are the complex responses of the brain? And what are the social experiences someone goes through with this technological addition to their senses? Dr. Kate Feller is director of the music therapy program in the School of Music at the University of Iowa and the principal investigator of the Music Perception Project for the Iowa Cochlear Implant Team. She will explain the technology of the cochlear implant and discuss how people adapt to a new world of sound. This program was recorded on Saturday, November 5, 2011. Today we're going to explore beauty and meaning in music as influenced by one particular type of technology, cochlear implants. I'd like to actually start the focus, though, on music. I think it's interesting to see that Americans actually spend more money on music than they do on prescription drugs. And that is not a trivial amount. We spent a lot of money on prescription drugs. In addition, American adolescents spend an average of over 100,000 uh, elected hours listening to popular music, which is more time than they actually spend in their classes from kindergarten through high school. Interestingly, music at 131 million sites is second only to the topic of sex as the most popular listing on the Google Internet search engine. So we can say that music really is a big social phenomenon. But another thing about music is it is so personal. I bet if I were to ask most of you here, you could tell me your favorite music, you could give me a couple artists you really love, and you could tell me music you really hate, that you just do not like to listen to. We also find that music is something that, for some people, is sort of a no big deal. For example, I have friends who are deaf, who um, don't listen to music, they don't yearn for music, and they know that music is really important to hearing people, but they're not really sure why. I also have friends who are deaf who love music, and they love to go dancing, and they love the beat of it. I have hearing friends who are kind of so-so about music, and I have other hearing friends, one in particular, who said, I want my last moment on this earth to be playing Mozart at the piano. Probably we fit someplace along the continuum uh, in this audience. Now, for those people who do connect with music, I like to think of music as somewhat of an acoustic scrapbook. It connects us with the people and the places and the events that make up the fabric of our lives. I'm going to take a few minutes to have you reflect on how music may affect you. In fact, we tend to take it for granted. I'm going to play some little excerpts, and as you listen to these, I'd like you to think of what that piece of music might mean to you. Some of these little excerpts may trigger particular memories or particular associations. Others may not particularly be important to you as an individual. So let's just do a little bit of self-exploration about the kinds of associations and the kinds of emotions that are triggered by music. Hush, little baby, don't say a word. Mama's gonna buy you a mockingbird. If that mockingbird won't sing, Mama's gonna buy it's a bit beside the wind up the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out.
makes me crumble She brought to me tumble They only made of clay But I love is yet to stay Must a man walk down Before you call him a man How many seas must the white dove sail Before she sleeps in the sand So how is it that we derive meaning from those rivers of sound? Now some of the excerpts perhaps triggered personal memories, things that occurred in your lives or people that you knew. Some may have fit within your own cultural framework. I'd like you to listen to another little tune and see if it brings back any memories for you. Sound clip please. Okay, for many of you here, perhaps you remember that great scene when Gene Kelly is out there stomping around in the puddles and he's swinging around the, the umbrella and he's in love and all these feelings of joy and optimism and hope are there. But for some of you, you might have a very different association because that same song, upbeat, happy, same rhythm, same notes, is associated with a scene of human depravity from Kubrick's Clockwork Orange. So in other words, the meaning or the association that you bring to that song are really influenced by your life experiences. Okay, so when we think about musical meaning, we can have those associative meanings that depend on our own personal life experiences. But music can also have what we call analytic or embodied meaning. In other words, the meaning is present in the music and its elements. One theorist, Leonard Meyer, described it this way. One musical event has meaning because it points to and makes us expect another musical event. So in other words, these individual acoustic sounds fit within a 
an accepted musical syntax and structure. From years and years of listening to music of certain types of genre, such as jazz or classical or pop, our brains are these amazing computers. We kind of know what to expect. We listen to a phrase and we know how it's going to end. Or we can kind of anticipate that because of all those years of listening to various patterns. I'm going to try to illustrate this point. First of all, I'd like you to listen to theme A. Clip, please. Okay, now that's really pretty easy, um, but is it really? In fact, what your brain is doing is it's listening to all these pitches and rhythms in relationship to one another, and you're forming basically a basic theme. Then what happens oftentimes is that the composer, to help you to remember that theme, will repeat it again. So they might play it again. Yum, bum, 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 bum. You can tell I'm not a voice major. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, but then what happens is that sometimes the composer wants to keep you interested and will then provide variations on that theme. amazing brains are able to hear that even though those notes are very different from the first time, it's still the same basic theme. Okay, now what happens next is that in most songs, the composer then will perform or will decide to have a contrasting theme. In this case, we'll call it theme B. And through these themes of A and B and variations and so forth, the composer will expand the compositional palette of rhythms, melodies, harmonies, and emotions. For example, they could choose to do it in a minor key, which would remind us of more of a sad and melancholy kind of a sound. So analytic or embodied meaning basically refers to the relations among theme A, theme B, and the variations in this particular tune. Now this is actually a fairly easy tune. Uh, there are many more complex, but hopefully you get the idea. Okay, now that we've considered basic musical meaning from the standpoint of associative and analytic meaning, let's listen to this musical clip, and I'd like you to see if you can pick up on that analytical and referential or associative meaning. do name that tune for that one. Okay, what that was was the simulation of the electrical stimulation transmitted by a bionic, bionic inner ear called the cochlear implant. Now, just imagine how that degraded representation of music affects your pattern recognition. Where is theme A? Where is theme B? So the embodied meaning becomes quite difficult. And if you can no longer identify that melody, how do you relate it to certain kinds of cultural references or past personal experiences? I think of it as um, the equivalent of ripping the acoustical scrapbook pages out and kind of shredding them. So I ask you, is this music meaningful? Is it a source of beauty? Is it even music? Well, I've asked a lot of our implant recipients what they think. And one person said, regarding music, it is so bad, it is hard to describe it. Around 85% of the implant recipients in our center say that music no longer sounds as enjoyable to them as it did prior to their deafness. Okay, here's another one that I think is, um, that speaks to the whole notion of sound not meaning anything. I can hear the music, but it just doesn't make any sense to me. One person described music as sounding like a cage full of squawking parrots. Other descriptions I've had heard are it sounds like a garbage disposal or it sounds like a bathtub draining. Another lady said to me, well, the organ at church sounds like a train coming through the sanctuary. It was so frustrating for her that she actually stopped going to church altogether. 
Well, look at this. This one kind of surprised me. I love good folk music. My husband and I are members of a close-knit folk community, and we meet in each other's homes weekly. Now, one of the things that I think is interesting about this is it's not only about the notes, is it? She has a close-knit community. So this really points up that for her, the musical sounds are part of fitting in to a culture and part of being part of a, a social network. Another person tells me, I try to listen to music daily. If I don't, I miss it. It satisfies a deep hunger of mine. I now prefer Baroque music most of all. Now, as we look at this range of quotes from it doesn't make any sense to me to I prefer Baroque music most of all, one of the things I want to point out today is that cochlear implant recipients have very diverse experiences. They are very different in terms of their perceptual acuity, and they also vary quite a bit in terms of the experience they have. Does music have meaning or beauty? So let's explore that technology for a few minutes. What is a cochlear implant and how does it work? The cochlear implant is an assistive device that's basically been designed to help people with severe and profound hearing loss who get little benefit from a hearing aid to understand speech. The device has external components and it also has surgically implanted components. Now, I want to point out that a cochlear implant does not restore normal hearing. It does not cure deafness. But for people who choose to communicate through speech, it is a tremendous benefit. I also want to point out that the cochlear implant is not appropriate for all people with hearing losses. Some people do not fit the selection criteria because, in fact, they have too much residual hearing and they're better off with a hearing aid, although hearing aids are also not perfect. But there are some people who have very little hearing who, in fact, choose not to use a cochlear implant for cultural reasons. For example, there are individuals who affiliate with deaf culture, who communicate primarily through sign language, and they do not want a cochlear implant for themselves or for their family members who are deaf. This is a very personal decision that is based not just on audiological status, but also on cultural values. Deaf culture is a rich and interesting topic in and of itself. Now today, the focus of my talk is on musical meaning and beauty for those who have chosen to use cochlear implants and for whom hearing and sound is a very meaningful thing. But there are people for whom that is not the case. I'd like to share with you a little video clip that will kind of animate for you how cochlear implants work so you can get a little sense of how they function. The hair cells of the inner ear transmit information to the hearing nerve, which sends it to the brain. In most cases of deafness, the hearing nerve still remains functional, but the hair cells have been lost or damaged. In a cochlear implant system, sound enters a microphone and travels to an external mini computer called a sound processor. The sound is processed and converted into digital information. This digital information is sent over a transmitter antenna to the surgically implanted part of the system. The implant will turn the sound information into electrical signals that travel down to an electrode array inserted into the tiny inner ear, or cochlea. The electrodes directly stimulate the auditory nerve sending sound information to the brain. Bypassing the damaged inner ear, the cochlear implant provides an entirely new mechanism for hearing. Okay, now this is more of a close-up which shows the electrode array inside the cochlea. So the signal that comes in through that external component, it's transmitted to the electrode array. And you can see those little small black um, electrode bands. Now, each of those little bands is assigned a certain frequency band. So for example, if you're thinking about the piano, one of those frequency bands might be associated with sounds or activated with sounds maybe A below middle C to E above middle C. That signal then is transmitted to the auditory nerve and then to the brain and 
the brain is what actually establishes a sense of meaning from those sounds. Now, cochlear implants have been remarkably successful in supporting speech perception. Adult CI users, on average, can achieve about 80% correct word recognition in a quiet listening environment. It's not as good in a noisy environment. Same as for hearing aids. Okay, unfortunately though, the signal presents a very distorted representation of pitch, as well as timbre or tone quality. So, nowadays, since the implants become pretty good for speech, there are a lot of implant recipients say, or who are saying, well, yeah, but how about music? I wanna enjoy music too. Next to speech recognition, music appreciation is the second most common desire among implant recipients. So let's take a little bit of a look at what happens to the musical sound when transmitted by the CI, and what are some of the problems with that? Why is it that the CI is not so good for music? Okay, I'm gonna mention two technical terms first, frequency and pitch. The term frequency refers to the physical sound created by a singer or a musical instrument. So for example, the uh, A above middle C is called A440. That means that that frequency is, that sound is vibrating 440 cycles per second. Pitch is what we hear, that we hear musical note A above middle C. So on this particular um, keyboard, we see the low frequencies at the left-hand side of the keyboard, around 27 hertz, and the keyboard goes all the way up to a fundamental frequency of over 4,000 hertz. Middle C is sort of around 252 hertz, okay? And then you hear the pitches of low to high, or the notes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, etc. Now, in a normal cochlea, there are about 30,000 hair cells that respond differentially to different frequencies. And we can make incredibly fine distinctions. That's how we tune our instruments or tune our voices to another singer. Unfortunately, cochlear implants have only a few electrode arrays to represent all these sounds. So for example, on this particular picture, if you look at these little numbers here, those are the electrode numbers in the array. So lonely little electrode 22 is responsible for all the pitches between about A below middle C up to about E above middle C. That's kind of like playing the piano with mittens. You just don't get the good frequency selectivity that you get from a normal healthy hearing ear. And notice, where are the electrodes in the bass? Cello, bass, trombone, gone. Not even represented. Some of the implant recipients that I know describe it as sounding like clicks. They don't even hear a sound down there. Okay, so um, could you play the sound clip, please? Okay, we're gonna talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly with cochlear implants. Okay, the good news is cochlear implants are pretty good at transmitting rhythm. So you can get a good beat, and a lot of implant recipients I know like to use it as helpful to their social dancing, or they like to tap their uh, foot to it, or they kind of get into it as kind of like everything is now rap music. Unfortunately, the timbre quality is not so good. Uh, we've already heard some of those descriptions of it sounding like a garbage disposal or a cage full of squawking parrots. Music tends to be very shrill or noisy or distorted. And the biggest challenge is pitch perception, how high or low a pitch sounds. This is the kind of thing that is going to be problematic if you're trying to sing in tune with someone else or if you're trying to tune your guitar. Sometimes it takes people as much as two octaves to determine whether or not a note is higher or lower. Let me show you just a little bit of data from our lab. On this particular task, we asked people if they were listening to something like a violin, a flute, a cello, a piano, and it was multiple choice. On average, when you see the blue bar, which is the normal hearing people, they can do this with one ear tied behind their back. Piece of cake, no problem. They got it about 90% correct. But look at the cochlear implant recipients. On average, for 51 CI recipients, 
They were above chance, but they were significantly poorer than normal hearing individuals. And because we usually listen to music for beauty, the unfortunate thing is that our data also show that they find the sound quality to be very disappointing or just plain ugly. One person told me, I cannot recognize a violin versus a flute or any other instrument. It sounds like a bunch of sounds kind of thrown together. Okay, now, in real life, we're listening to very complex music. So we've tested CI users on real life musical excerpts of country, pop, and classical music. Things that most people have heard, like The Gambler, Love Me Tender, The Wedding March, that sort of thing. Now, these particular excerpts have rhythmic cues. They do pretty well with that. They also sometimes contain lyrics. That can help them out. And some of them have very unique timbre blends. But if you notice on the left, you see that the CI recipients in the country condition only got about 20% correct, while for the normal hearing people, that was much easier. Sometimes they didn't actually remember what the tune was, so we actually had to work out um, some of those issues. But on average, CI recipients are significantly poorer than normal hearing people in recognizing real world music. Okay, in this particular example, we tested listeners with simple songs played on a synthesizer. So it would be songs like Happy Birthday or Row, Row, Row Your Boat. Now these no longer have unique timbral features, they no longer have the lyrics. And as you can see, this is very easy for the normal hearing adults on the right. They get about 83% correct, but the implant recipients perform less than 19% correct. And about the only cue they say that's helpful to them is if the rhythm happens to be very distinct. Okay, this is a very busy slide. Um, this shows individual responses. So if you look at the very left-hand side, you see number of cases, and that means that about 20 people who, use, who are CI adult users were able to get pitched a uh, ranking of is this higher or lower with just one semitone. But look at the rest of them. There are CI recipients who need as much as 24 different semitones to tell if a sound is higher or lower. In contrast, most of the normal hearing people can do this with one semitone or a few others. So this particular rather busy slide points up two things. One is that pitch perception is poorer for CI recipients than it is for normal hearing listeners by and large. But secondly, it shows you what a diverse group those cochlear implant recipients are. Some perform somewhat similarly to normal hearing people, while other people can't even recognize a two octave difference to tell which is higher or lower. Now, I think that that variability is particularly exciting and interesting because to me, it points up the unique contribution that the individual human being brings to the use of this technology. This technology does restore a new sense of sound to persons with profound deafness, which is great. But that technology is only part of the equation. Even though CI users tend to use similar devices, the, the human beings using these devices bring very or obtain very different benefits. So to me, the technology is amazing, but the human part of this equation is absolutely astounding. Okay, so let's change the diagram now to acknowledge the individual listener as a key factor in musical meaning. Okay, this diagram shows some of the factors that we have found in our lab to be significant predictors for which individuals get the best music perception and enjoyment. I'm gonna focus on a few specific ones. Some people have more healthy nerve survival in, and they may have a more efficient brain for processing uh, ongoing information. So those individuals who are just good pattern seekers tend to do better at this kind of listening task than others. And if they haven't had long periods of auditory deprivation, they're also likely to do a little bit better. Age is also an important component. Younger individuals tend to have greater neuroplasticity. Their brains are more flexible. And so they can oftentimes adapt more readily to this odd signal than an adult can. So the age at which a person lost their hearing is an important factor. 
However, the adults may be older, their brains might not be quite as plastic, but they've got a definite advantage. They have heard timbre and pitch through normal hearing mechanism. And so what they can do is they can use contextual cues, or what we call top-down processing, to try to make sense of the musical experiences. The children going up with an implant have never actually heard a normal musical sound. And so you might ask yourself the question, do children who grow up using a CI derive meaning and beauty from music? Well, interestingly, 73% of the pediatric CI recipients enrolled in our program are involved in school music. Does that mean they love it? Not necessarily. I know my share of normal hearing children who were forced to go to piano lessons by, because their mom and dad made them do it. It's not that they necessarily loved it. But let's find out a little bit more about this. Okay, about half the children in our program, from the age of toddlers to teens, do enjoy music and they choose to participate in music in school, and they choose to listen to music spontaneously. They have favorite records, they have favorite things they like to listen to. A little over 40% seem to enjoy the social aspects of music, more perhaps than the music per se. For example, one teenager I talked to told me, oh, I asked her, do you like music? Oh yeah, I love music. Well, what do you like about it? She said, well, my sister loves Madonna, so I like it too. And then I said, well, what else about it? Well, I love the outfits they wear on the videos. I said, well, what else about it? Well, I love to dress up and go to a concert, and I can really look cool. I said, and so how about the music? Oh, it's OK. So in other words, it wasn't so much the music, but it was the social component of music. On the red bar, you see those children who, in fact, are so young and have had so little experience that the parents weren't actually sure if they like music or not. And there is a 10% group that, in fact, finds music to be egregious or aversive. The first young man basically just said that music made no sense to him. He said he watches MTV, but he turns off the sound, puts on the closed captioning, so he gets to see all the dirty words, but he doesn't listen to the music. It's your parents' worst nightmare. The second one, in contrast, describes the French horn is sounding mournful, and he says that the sound of taps sends chills up his spine. He talks about how cool jazz is, and he talks about the difference between really fine musicians and poor musicians. So these two are very, very sharp contrasts. In fact, the second one has been in jazz band, he's been in concert band, and he was even in the Hawkeye marching band, and music is a huge part of his life. Okay. Factors other than age and hearing history are also important to music perception and enjoyment. These are factors that fit into what we might call experience-dependent plasticity. That is, human brains adjusting and adapting to this signal as a result of life experiences, either formal training or informal listening. These factors include one's cultural context, hearing music within the cultural framework of which you live, formal musical training, the amount of time that they dedicated to listening carefully to music after implantation, and this also requires motivation to persist, because at first, it's not that great. Here are a few quotes to illustrate the importance of experience in getting benefit from a CI. It does help to see the person singing if I know what it's supposed to sound like. For example, the Star Spangled Banner sounded fairly normal after about a week into the Olympics, but I think this is my brain filling in the missing pieces. And I agree. In this particular instance, the recipient's use of prior knowledge of the music and that cultural framework helped her to hear and appreciate the music. Another says, initially, it was very disappointing to listen to music with my CI. Better processing strategies have helped but I've had to adapt as well. After accepting a new sound, it can be extremely enjoyable to listen to music now. It's just different. So the key for her was actually establishing new and realistic expectations of what music was. And in fact, oftentimes we find that with our training, we help people to identify new pieces of music that they can enjoy. As a result of all these generous individuals who shared their life experiences with us, we decided hey, could we help those who are getting less benefit to get more out of their CI 
if we help them out with some of those great insights from some of the more successful music listeners. So we developed a music training program. Our training program includes listening exercises that require careful and repeated listening, which promotes neural reorganization and more efficient perceptual processing. In other words, we help them to sort of relearn pitch and timbre discrimination and recognition through this new device. It also includes the use of contextual cues, helping them to relate what they're hearing now to their prior listening experiences. We also provide multimodal experience to help them uh, to connect everything, and we also want to help them build realistic expectations. We actually provide them with a virtual support group of other CI recipients who have given tips and suggestions. Now, the outcomes are not perfect, but what you see from the training group on the right is that they improve significantly from pre-testing to post-testing in being able to recognize familiar songs such as uh, Love Me Tender, The Gambler, uh, Moonlight Sonata, um, Sousa Marches, and a whole host of other songs that they're likely to hear in everyday life. Here's what one of the uh, wives of one of our training participants said. For the first time in my years, uh, for the first time in years, we went to a movie and my husband enjoyed the sound again. We're going to the movies again. So in other words, what has happened is it has really opened up their life experience. Another wrote, I just returned from a Christmas concert last night when they sang, Do You Hear What I Hear? I was overcome with emotion. The wife of another recipient said, I came home and found my husband enjoying a symphony concert on PBS for the first time in years. I have my husband back. So returning back to this diagram, I would like to emphasize the power of the individual human being who has the ability to enrich what technology has to offer by bringing to bear their personal memories, their cultural perspectives, their motivation, strategic listenings, and a strong desire to connect to their world through music. As several have shared with me, the music ceases to be a mechanical, uh, to be mechanical and becomes creative and personal, a language of sorts from deep within myself. If you are a musician, you will know what I am talking about. I think those of us who were intimately connected to music before our hearing losses notice the little ways that music is part of the warp and woof of life and relish our recovery of something priceless. After my dad's funeral, I went home and all I could do was sit and stare at the walls. I put in a CD and listened to music for hours. Eventually, I found myself able to function again. I want to encourage you with your implant music project. The implant lets us hear music. Music opens up ways to enjoy and cope with life. Can we try that clip? Hopefully it'll work. Okay, I guess it's not gonna work. Sorry about that. Um, can we try the next slide? No, okay. Well, um, what I wanted to play for you there was the sound that's kind of like this. I'm gonna try to uh, imitate a cochlear implant. My best imitation of a cochlear implant. <laughs> okay. And what the pianist is actually playing was bum ba dum, bum ba dum, bum, 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 bum. That was the Moonlight Sonata that you heard in that little cochlear implant clip that I played for you earlier. So I ask you the question, and I close my remarks here to open it to uh, group discussion. Is it still music? Does music have meaning and beauty for cochlear implant recipients? Okay, good question. She asked if words are so much better 
Do songs with words, the lyrics, make a difference, or does it actually mess it up? Great question. What we find is that sometimes implant recipients will use the words to try to make sense of what it is. The problem is that sometimes the words are backed up by a big orchestra or a lot of uh, percussion. So what we find is that if there's just a little, for example, uh, Paul McCartney's Yesterday, our implant recipients get that pretty easily. That's one of their top 10 hits because it's just a very quiet little guitar in the background and Paul has pretty good articulation. And they also know that song and it's a very simple, slow piece of music. So they absolutely can use the lyrics as long as they're not covered over by a really loud accompaniment. And that's one of the strategies that we teach them to listen for. Okay, uh, so in other words, if you've heard music through a normal hearing ear, yeah, or a hearing aid, what that means is that your, your brain has developed certain mental representations of what music sounds like, what pitches are like, what an oboe sounds like, what a flute sounds like, what a string bass sounds like. And so when you hear something, let's say that somebody tells you, okay, now you're going to listen to the Moonlight Sonata. Your brain goes into action and it sort of uh, brings back what the Moonlight Sonata used to sound like. And by taking that information, your brain is working in conjunction with what's coming into the ear, and it actually helps you to make some sense out of it. So if you've never heard... Your brain helps convert it to what it remembers. Absolutely. It's kind of like if you're in a noisy environment and you're trying to understand someone you're talking to, you may not understand every word they said, but if you know the basic context of what they're talking about, if you know, for example, that they have three children and they're from Winnetka or wherever, you can start to piece together little bits and pieces of what you couldn't understand because your brain is doing all that work for you. These CI recipients who have heard music before they lost their hearing do that same sort of thing, especially if they know what they're going to be listening to in advance. Now, kids who have grown up with this implant have never heard normal pitch, especially if they were congenitally deaf, I should say and they've never heard the normal sound of, say, a flute versus a violin. The interesting thing, though, is that's music to them. I consider it as being kind of like everything is rap music because you get good rhythm and you get the lyrics. Uh, I've actually had a couple of engineers who they're crazy about their cochlear implant stuff, and they say, well, why don't you just have everybody listen to rap music? And I'm going, you know, this 75-year-old woman over here doesn't really connect with rap music. I said, the deal is not to get her to like rap music, but rather to see if we can improve this device so that she can be restored to the culture that means so much to her. I've actually had people cry in my office because they want to enjoy their granddaughter's cello recital. They don't want to go around doing yo, 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 you know what I'm saying? In other words, it isn't just an acoustical signal. They want to connect again with the things that they lost. The kids growing up, this is music to them, and a lot of them really like it. It's also amazing that because of their very plastic brains, I have seen children who can be trained, but it takes hours and hours, to be able to sing somewhat in tune. And they've learned to sing um, in a pleasant fashion. But then there are other children who, honestly, they'd have a much more satisfying experience out on the soccer field. You don't have to play at Carnegie Hall to be a wonderful person. So I think a lot of this is trying to find what's going to work for each human individual, helping them to reconnect with their society in a meaningful way. Yes, the gentleman asked if someone loses their hearing in midlife uh, and they can rem probably remember what Moonlight Sonata sounded like, uh, can the cochlear implant contribute something helpful to that listening process? Yes, it can, because in fact, I wish I could have gotten that sound clip or that video clip up for you, because when you listen to that, you actually hear a good rhythmic representation of that ba da 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 So they take their brain and their wonderful memories, and then they take that rhythmic input, and it starts to sound normal. In fact, I've listened to some of these clips so often that I can actually hear it now, I've trained my brain to pull and extract things from it. Yes, sir. And then there was a lady there, too, actually. I was just going to try to usher here and tell you, the, I couldn't hear you in the back. I'm a, uh, 
cochlear implant wearer for two years and not happy with it. Mm -hmm. And I was impressed with your one slide. Besides your presentation, we should give a nice round of applause for that. <laughs> Thank you. Great things evidently happened in Iowa. Um, but the one slide said the cochlear implant in a quiet situation, you didn't say you will or you might, one of those words, get 80% of the hearing. But that's almost like uh, whatever kind of hearing aid, and like your computer, it suddenly quit and suddenly you can't. So you're on the bus and the guy across the aisle says, which is the next stop? Is it Clark Street? And with all the traffic and the bus, you can't hear a damn thing. I understand a recent study, and I've been to two um, hearing loss association meetings, conventions in the last uh, two years, once a year, and a new study done by a researcher has indicated that the three major manufacturers have done such a good job that it's, you're, the implant in your head here is drawing on electrodes that they're not supposed to be drawing on. Yeah. So as a result, you get static, and I get static that sounds like bacon frying. Uh, and you get in a noisy room with even 10 people or in an auditorium like this, and on stage, you can't hear what the actors are saying. Mm -hmm. So uh, the other thing is the captions is the buzzword. So mm -hmm. can you uh, do that, and I'll walk this around so we can hear everybody. Okay. Well, one of the things that I, first of all, um, it is absolutely true that that slide that says 80% is on average and it's in a quiet listening environment. And this gentleman makes a very important point. We live in a very noisy society. One of the things that happens almost all the time is every time there's a party, people feel the obligation to have background music to set ambience. Well, I'm a musician. I love music, but I'm at the point now where I don't play music in the background at parties at my house because people end up talking over it. And I know a lot of my friends who are getting in the age range where they're using hearing aids or other types of things have more difficulty with background noise. Restaurants, the worst. You've got clink, 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 clink. You've got waiters coming in and out. The doors are slamming. They've got loud stuff going on here. Then they have the lighting down so dark that you practically need to use Braille to see the menu, right? OK, and so then you're trying to have a conversation with your partner. You can't see them. There's all this loud noise in the background. It's an absolute nightmare for people with cochlear implants or for hearing aid users or even people who are just starting to lose some of their hearing. And so our noisy society is a real, really um, huge problem for people who are starting to lose hearing, whether or not they use a hearing aid or a cochlear implant. The implants have done a lot of work on trying to improve noise suppression in the background, but it also is a problem because as we get older, our brains are not quite as good at uh, extracting the target signal from the background noise. It's also part of our neuroplasticity and slowing down. So it makes for a lot of work. I actually, when I take my mother out to lunch, for example, the first thing I do is I ask for a place in a quiet part of the restaurant, and then I ask the waiter, please turn down the sound. And she does it for me. We go back there again and again, because they actually do that. Um, but I think our noisy society is uh, something that people with cochlear implants and hearing aids have to negotiate all the time. There was a question I, right there. I have the mic. Right oh, there. I'm sorry, okay. I have a question. Do you get better results from live music versus recorded music versus digitized music? Okay, interesting question. Uh, some of the individuals do better with live music, especially if they can see the singer's face. They may be able to lip read a little bit. They may be also be able to get some cues about the rhythm. But actually, you can't get much about high or low from watching someone play the violin. Even the piano, you know it's going up and down. But there isn't some little light popping up going A, B, C, D. So there's a lot that's missing. You also can't do closed captioning of notes. So um, live can give you some cues. Um, you need a very good sound source, though, to try to get rid of background noise. That's another th problem, though, with some concert situations is they're noisy. People are r rustling around and things like that. But a good sound source is very important, and being close to the performer may help you as well. I've got a question. Um, many of the Asian languages are tonal languages. Have cochlear implants, have they been successful at all in adapting to that or, or making it uh, 
effective in those cultures with those tonal languages? By tonal languages, what we mean is that there are sounds within Chinese, Thai, uh, some African languages, and so forth, where the way you say a particular syllable makes as much difference as, or the pitch of it is as meaningful as just the pitch itself. So there's like ma, ma, ma. I can't do the Chinese thing, but there are four ways to say the tones ma. And you might either be calling your mother a mother, or a scold, or a donkey. I mean, you can make some big mistakes saying the wrong tone. And cochlear implants are not very good with pitch, um, and so it can be more difficult for people who use Chinese or, or Thai to actually understand speech. However, they also get durational cues. They also get other types of in, uh, cues besides frequency um, that help, or stress cues that can also help. But they are significantly poorer uh, growing up with a cochlear implant than they would be with normal hearing. Uh, I wonder about the um, three-year, 10-year-old congenitally deaf kid who, who loved Jazz. I mean, mm -hmm. jazz is not rap. It's more than rhythm. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's um, tone. It's variation. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did he get that? That's a really interesting question. I have one more video clip I wish I could have shown you. It's of a young man who grew up. He gradually lost his hearing. His hearing became so bad at age 14 that he finally, the family finally said, I think we need to get you a cochlear implant. He drove, his family drove six hours to the University of Iowa for him to have his surgery. The whole way there, he was listening to um, Pink Floyd albums because he just loved Pink Floyd. And um, he listened to music for the whole week before he had his surgery because he was afraid he'd lose music altogether. The interesting thing is after he got his implant, he told me that music just sounded horrible. But he made it as a personal goal that he was going to be able to understand the words. Back to that uh, first question. He wanted to understand the words in the entire compendium of Pink Floyd's music. This kid is one of the best implant recipients we have because what he did is he trained himself to listen to very fine distinctions and he was persistent. So he actually through that listening to a very difficult task but using as the guide rail, if you will, the lyrics, he retaught himself to start appreciating songs he had heard before. No, but the three point ten month, three year, 10 month old, I mean, if, if, you, if you get a cochlear implant at that age, you don't have any experience with music. Well, interestingly, that, that one young uh, man who was implanted at age three and congenitally deaf, he loves jazz. Now, he doesn't get what you and I get from jazz, but he has listened to it a lot. He, he participated in music from the time he was a really little kid. He cannot match pitches and sing along with other kids in choir, but he has played in jazz band, and he listens to jazz all the time, and he, but he's also, his brain is amazing. He has a very, um, he has an old fashioned implant even, um, but he has been able to bring to it an incredible sense of beauty uh, beyond what would be my expectation, knowing what he gets from that signal. But then I also know individuals who, they just find it so horribly disappointed that they, they aren't willing to go through the pain of it to try to restore some enjoyment. Does, does the cause of the individual's hearing loss determine their ability or impact their ability to benefit? Rede redevelop their relationship with music, I think? It, it can. There are some types of um, conditions such as meningitis. Meningitis can cause overnight hearing loss. Uh, what happens sometimes with meningitis is you get a bony overgrowth in the cochlea and that can actually undermine the ability of the electrodes to make a good connection with the auditory nerve. So we find that some of those individuals don't seem to do quite as well, or if there's been some sort of severe damage, uh, then what happens is even though the auditory nerve is stimulated by those little electrode bands, there's some limitation. So that's where those first couple circles I showed you, the health of the auditory system actually is a factor in how well people do. Now we're in the middle of some brand new research where we're actually able to look at the um, uh, cortical potential and see how people respond to changes in pitch and timbre to see what kind of health is there. And we actually get an internal view of how they're responding to training. So we hope that will give us an idea of who's a good candidate for training and who is not. It's sort of our new frontier right now. 
As you are looking at um, people with cochlear implants, do you find that most people are satisfied with the process that one goes through, not only with music, but with uh, speech <coughs> and communication skills? Are they, they, are they pleased that they've had the surgery, or is it adding frustration, and do they wish that, I mean, where does that all feed in? Because I hear this gentleman saying it's frustrating to him, and a lot of the stories that I'm hearing sound like there's so much frustration, and I'm wondering where the enjoyment of life comes in. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Uh, once again, I think there's a lot of variability. I, I know individuals who say it's actually changed their life because now they actually can communicate with people. Um, they are getting enough benefit that they feel they can go back to work, they can be a part of society. But I think the thing that sometimes happens is that people will get an overly rosy or optimistic picture that it's going to cure them, and it doesn't. That can be a problem. Sometimes with websites, you look at things and you hear only the best scenario. You don't hear the sort of the range of these people did really well, these people are getting good benefit in these situations, and these people had a hard time. Uh, I think for speech, it's considerably better. But I also hope that the cochlear implant uh, support groups and advocacy groups will keep working really diligently to inform the public about things like background noise in various types of social situations uh, so that people won't expect them to be cured. They're not cured, they're, they're assisted, but they still need to have a lot of things to support them. I, I think we are, we're supposed to, what, two more questions? Two more questions. Um, I believe you've been in touch with my nephew, Oliver Searle, in Glasgow, yeah. in Scotland. I, I, I've heard him talk about Who's a composer. Mm -hmm. And earlier this year, he came here to Chicago with a piece that he had composed for very young children called The Farmer's Cheese, mm -hmm. where, uh, based on a book that somebody had written. And that was a combination of the music and actors mm -hmm. acting it out and words. So my question is, it would seem to be that it's necessary, especially for young children, to have this combination maybe to help them. Are there other people doing things like that and composing or especially for CI uh, yeah. people? Yeah, actually, actually one, of the, um, one of the things that we have found with our children is that when they look at things like um, videos, like The Little Mermaid or whatever, um, they do use the visual information a lot. I also, th we also at the University of Iowa have a music therapy program for children who use cochlear implants, and we specifically design our activities for the children taking into account what their CI is like. And so we have them involved in listening to music, um, listening exercises, singing songs, creating and composing, having them really working with this sound, and it really, we think, does make a big difference in how comfortable they feel with it, but they have lots of visual inputs. And we also are saying, you don't have to play at Carnegie Hall to enjoy music. It doesn't have to be like that. Actually, if that were the case, most of us wouldn't fit that category. So yeah, we actually do try to do that. I have time for one more. I, I'm sorry, and I hope I'm speaking loud enough. I don't have the, the mic. The mic's coming right to you. I'm sorry, and I, I hope I'll speak loud enough. You. Um, spoke a moment ago about the need for advocacy groups to address issues such as um, sound levels and acoustics in our society. Could you please comment on the importance of therapy, a word, by the way, that you used 87 times during your talk. And the reason I counted is because several of us here are in, deeply involved in ed educating children with cochlear implants and digital hearing aids. Mm -hmm. And part of advocacy that I'd like you to address is the fact that both public school systems and insurance companies um, and our in public insurance uh, system, Medicaid and Medicare, often fail to recognize that an important component of be quality of life for people who use cochlear implants and other forms of hearing technologies are habilitation, therapy, and education. Yes, absolutely. I could not agree with you more. In fact, my problem is that hearing, aid, hearing aids, too, you know, the insurance covers getting fitted and having that thing put in your head. But in fact, you need to learn all sorts of strategies for managing the environment. Even things like turn off the water at the sink when you're talking to somebody. 
or turn down the television before you ask a question. Children actually do need, who are growing up with implants, need rehabilitative support. And they need to have classroom teachers who understand how the noisy classroom environment can really be detrimental to their learning situation. And unfortunately, a lot of people do think, is this pop, pop it in, it's a cure, it is not. Uh, children learning to listen through hearing aids or cochlear implants need other kinds of support. They can do just magnificently, but they need support. And so yes, I'm really glad you brought that up. Same thing for adults. Adults also need support, and I think it would be great if there were a number of programs that were available to adult implant recipients to help them. So they don't expect, they, sometimes what they think is, I'm the only failure here, instead of actually understanding that many people have to uh, become accustomed to it. Just like, uh, you know, let's say you get an artificial knee. You have to do rehabilitation to use it properly. Same thing, in my opinion, is true for many CI recipients. And I think I'm supposed to stop yeah. there. I think we're entitled to a commercial here. I'm <laughs> going to give a plug for the Hearing Loss Association. Look it up when you get home. There's two chapters in the greater Chicago area. One, a new organization meets in Old Town. We have a meeting tonight. We're meeting in an empty space on the fourth floor of the um, Second City building. And there's another group that meets in the western suburbs. But look it up on your computer, Hearing Loss Association of America, and that'll show you chapters all over the country. 25% of the American public is hard of hearing. And so it's important that we know about that. And the audiologists will not tell you about this for some reason. They don't want to dabble and recommend another organization. So get out there and listen. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Professor. Thank you so much for coming today.